Okay, the state of mind uh, today we have. Um, well, first of all, if you like what you see, please subscribe. Hit the buttons right here. Blah la 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 la. Uh, let's just say this guest. I had I looked her up. And I almost called and said that I, I'm not worthy of interviewing her because <laughs> her credits are un freaking believable. And I know her sister's famous. That's cool. You know, Michelle's the best and all that. But Dee Dee is not only an a incredibly talented actress, she's worked with the just like George Clooney, Keanu Reeves. Uh, but she, I mean, it just goes down the line. But that's not why. I mean, I was impressed, but that's not why. You know, she took off 10 years to get her master's degree in social work. Now, to me, somebody who barely, <laughs> barely graduated from high school, I don't even know if I did graduate because it's a long story. But to, to do that, to, to, be who, who she is, and then 10 years and get your, your bachelor's degree is, is phenomenal to me. And I'm going to start this interview where I usually don't start because I just, I've been thinking about it, and this is where I'm going to start. This is Dee Dee Pfeiffer. Appreciate you being here. It's amazing. Thank you. Um, Look how cute she is right now. <laughs> I, mm, I've been introduced before but never like that that was really beautiful thank you, you almost made me cry oh uh, wow well, so well that was beautiful thank you it's all you know wow. it's the truth and it's what it is and i want to ask you a question yeah. this is where we're going to start and then you may make me cry because now you're i'm getting emotional now god darn it so fast now, this is, <laughs> i've never gotten this emotional this quick I do that to people. that's beautiful i love it what are we going to do about the homeless people oh um that was my area of concentration when I was going for my master's alongside mental health um, and addiction. Um, the problem with, I feel, with the homeless situation is that they don't consider it an epidemic. That's number one. It needs a czar. It needs someone to, to look at it as a large problem and a multi-layered problem. Yeah. It is not just about housing. And it's not just about getting off of their lazy, am I allowed to cuss on this? Yeah, yeah, it's YouTube. Yeah, lazy asses or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Or throw an enabling, I mean, in the enabling's yeah. over here. Get off your lazy asses over here. We have a lot of groups of people that have polar opposite opinions about this epidemic. Yes. And we don't have a smart person on top to bring together like minds and, and a multidisciplinary uh, way to attack it. Yeah. That we're missing that. I mean, because there's like little, there's groups all over trying their hardest, and you have individuals trying their hardest. But and how others come it never, just it nimby, never works? Nothing ever works. It's not because we're not viewing it as an epidemic, right? If it's an epidemic, then you get a czar and you get someone to go in and you start to look at it on different levels. Yeah. You have to look at it through a mental health issue, a, a addiction, yeah. trauma. Yeah. I mean, and they love to tango together. Then you took the elements, biopsychosocial. You yeah. have to, and it's an individual thing. No two people who are homeless are the same. Any more than no two people no. With, with bipolar are the same or right. alcoholism are right. the same. Right. So when you're looking out there at these people who I worked with for a year in, in the bells, in their encampments, under the freeways, with pit bulls, which I love. You did that? Oh, yeah, I did outreach. And let me tell you, these are... These are fucking people with real problems and real issues. Society is shat on them. Systems are broken. Family, uh, communities, somehow they were scorned. Or maybe their addiction went out of control and it was never diagnosed properly or taken care of. Spiraled out of control. Their mental health issue was never diagnosed properly, treated. That spiraled out. Throw them together. You throw in trauma. <laughs> Yes. You mean, and then you wonder why they're out there, and then right. they're re-traumatized when they're out there. So just this one little thing I'm saying is saying, look at the layers. And I could go on all day about this one because it's my area yeah. that I was really passionate about. So we have to go into it with an individual perspective. Who are you out here? What's your story? Right. What's but, your story, man? And break that down like an onion, peel it back, and start to address it okay. individually. Now. Here's why I bring it up. Well, I know that you're you're into it and all that, and and that's yeah. why I brought it up. But it, I I just cannot 
stop at a stoplight, look to my right or left, and see a homeless person and not drive away going, how do we let this happen? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're human beings. Now, there's another side to this too. I think you, you'll understand. Mm-hmm. May, we don't know their whole story on some of them. So maybe the, the families have done everything they can mm-hmm. or could mm-hmm. to help and it just didn't happen. That's whether right. it be money, mm-hmm. whether it be that they got too much violence or whatever it was. But in everything you're saying makes a lot of sense. It almost reminds me of the pandemic is mm-hmm. the best thing that happened to mental health. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we're talking about Right, it. because before, you know, I've, I did Oprah 30 years ago, mm-hmm. and I thought I was going to blow up. I thought I was going to be the, the <laughs> mental <laughs> What th- happened, honey? Yeah, yeah. Got not planned. Nothing happened. <laughs> it's like, okay, no, I'm not not taking anything away from that, but yeah. but uh, I believe in since I've been doing this for 30 years about talking about uh, bipolar, anxiety, depression. It's only been the pandemic that I've seen the change. Whether it be you turn on the TV, if you're bipolar one, you know, if you're bipolar mm-hmm. two, so it's similar to that, although. The curse and the blessing, the curse is the suicides are enormous now. Yeah. I think you, you tapped on something that was really important when, to back up. You said the families yeah. didn't blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Well, a lot of people land on the streets and, and find themselves experiencing homelessness um, for a lot of reasons. Each one's very individual. Yeah. Somewhere along the line, something went wrong. And let me tell you, nobody wakes up and says, hey, I think I want to be homeless. That sounds no. like a good idea. Any right. better than I woke up saying I want to be an alcoholic. Yeah. That fucking never happened no. to me or you with bipolar. Did you ever wake yeah. up and say you wanted that? No. So in a way, we keep blaming the person yeah. who end up in these situations or, or end up with this disorder or this yes. disease of alcoholism. And I think that's a start is the way we look at them, right? And we do walk by them and we try to ignore them or we... Um, clear them out of the park. They just go to the next park. Come on. Or they spread out. And I mean, this is what we had to help them move their things when the city did come to clear them out. So because those things that you might think are their junk are their possessions. So I think that at the end of the day, we also What have, is their thoughts? Well, here's the thing. What when are you're their... living out on the streets, think about this. When you're living on the streets, you're amygdala. Everything that you, the fright or flight is on guard, right? When you're yeah. out there. Because there's also um, a lot of things that happen in their own communities. Um, there's a lot of stuff that they can't go to the police to. So they're not protected, so they protect each other. So they create their own community within a community. When that community on the outside has somehow yeah, somehow turned their back on them or, or failed them along the way and they didn't get the help they needed, or maybe just sometimes I noticed when I was out there, they just want to be heard. How about that? Yeah. People stop listening and you start to feel alone. And if you've unresolved trauma, which is a big one, we don't talk about that one a lot. A lot of people come yeah. into their adult life with un, un, result, un, yeah, yeah, yeah. untreated, undiagnosed yeah, yeah. trauma. Yeah. You throw in, like I said, all the other layers, and now that's a recipe for just going, I'm out of here, right? Yeah, yeah. So th- that needs to be addressed on an individual uh, like um, perspective. Who are you? Let me hear your story, and let's yeah. see if we can peel back the onion. Because yeah. maybe this is about you don't want to be housed because you don't want to lose your community. I get you. But maybe, maybe he's used to the noise of the freeway because it stops the voices. Yeah. It stops the voices. So you put him in an apartment and it's quiet. He's going to go mad. And it's, that's what happens. So people go, well, he just lost his voucher because he just went back out. Right. Why did he go back out? Exactly. Well, he, but right? they don't want to take that time to, to, in, to well, it's, peel off the whoever would, the upper yeah. people are. They don't want to sit there and go, give me your story. That, and it's not fair, but they should. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Is it that they don't want to or they don't have the means First of all, okay. these are social workers like myself. She's I, incredible. Dude, yeah. social workers make no money. <laughs> I mean, I was about to graduate when my brother-in-law, David E. Keller, texted me when I was in the departmental health saying, hey, are you still acting? Because I have this role of Denise and Big Sky. And I didn't know how I was going to support myself as a damn social worker because they make no money. And I had two boys and all these animal animals I keep rescuing. And they like to eat. I don't know why, but they all <laughs> like to eat. So I didn't know how I was going to do it. So Big Sky actually saved my ass. He threw me a lifeline. He didn't even know it. But... I know all those social workers out there who are trying really hard in all the organizations, LA Family Housing, 
et cetera, who are out there trying, but these people are not making a lot of money. They're their uh, rousters of clients is outrageous. Damn. So is it, do they don't want to, or do they not have the time, the resources to go out there individually and really uh, address each person? Are there any you're not giving them an incentive, man. You work, no. the, you work the shit out of them. No one appreciates their, no. their work at all. You're the first one blamed. Those are go, angels though. That they really are. I went to school with a lot of people. Those who, are angels. Who wanted to help be part of the solution. Yeah. And it's a shame that I can make more money on big sky. Yeah. To be paid to wait, act for free. Yeah. Because you know that's what we do. Yeah. And then yet as a social worker, which is such a, an amazing My thing. My God. I don't even work with kids, by the way. I can't because I would, I would be arrested if I worked. I would be. Yeah. I'm a mama bear. I can't. Oh, yeah. Nah, yeah. You know, right. I now, yeah. answer this. Are yeah. there any... How can I say this? Oh, just say it. You can say it. Say it. Sometimes I drive by homeless people. And I think maybe... Maybe not now I don't do that because life is so grand. But maybe at some points in my life I've driven by homeless people and thought, are there any homeless people who just love it? Just no worries? Just they don't have to deal with... Yeah. Right? I'm not going to lie. Yes, there are some people who are perfectly happy not being told to shut up at 10 o'clock because the neighbor's telling them to shut up. They don't like right, the rules. Right. Hey, actually, I don't mind that, right? Uh, my dog barks a lot. It's a great Pyrenees. Anyways, um... They're, they, the rules that we have set in society, they're not crazy about, and they're not going to be told what to do. You know, these, some of these people are vets. Yeah. And they went to war for us and came back in society. Yes. And society said, oh, you have PTSD? Ah, here's a pill. Go take, go deal with it. Oh, the... Right? Actually, um... Say it. The vets out there, um... Because I work with the adult population. Like I said, I couldn't do children. There's no it's way. too much, yeah. Um, but I... Worked with a lot of um, women who had children who lost it, lost their children to the system because somewhere along the line something happened. And now they're out there living under a freeway or, you know, with other people and being raped. And Jesus. they didn't start with a drug problem, but they ended up with a drug problem because the only way to survive out there was to do drugs to numb the pain from the trauma of having lost the child. My question is, how did you lose that child? Oh, are we talking about an undiagnosed, untreated addiction or mental health yeah. problem? See, sometimes these things started with that, and it bulldozes into losing everything, and then they're out there, and then they just feel helpless and hopeless. And But the vets... Um, I had one to ask me if he could come live in my garage. And uh, that broke my heart. But. And, um, you, know, you know, I wanted to take him home. You can't though, right? No, of course. My my really large preceptor. Yeah. <laughs> he's been doing outreach for like a thousand. He actually invented outreach. Um, he saw how soft hearted I was and how they would respond to me. And. Um, he jumps in and he's like, oh, okay, well, we can't have any of that because he thought he saw my wheels turning. And um, he's kind of reminded my dad, actually. Yeah. And um, in a wheelchair and all broken. And he said, I reminded him of his girlfriend or his wife who left him with his kid. So there's that story went super deep. Wow. And he had just been in a fight the night before where he was fending himself off in a wheelchair when he had gashes down his arm. And I mean, these stories just go on and on. And here's this a man who went to war for us and he's out there and. That's it just feels like we need to peel back the, you see, so there's a lot of stuff going on with this one guy, and, yeah. Um, Can it ever get fixed? Yeah, we need, we need a czar. We need someone to first call it what it is, right? Wouldn't, if we had a huge thing that happened with the earth right now, what is it called, FEMA? Wouldn't yeah. they declare it a world something, and then FEMA yeah. comes in and, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what, what we you... need, someone to declare this an epidemic and get a czar, get the uh, better minds together and then you come in and you start going into these encampments and you start breaking it up but you you're gonna have to need you know some money to do that yeah, but yeah, i know yeah. a lot of money's thrown at this epidemic a lot of money's thrown at it yeah and they keep asking for more money and i was out there in the field and i have to say they're not gonna like me for saying this but i wonder where that money's going yeah that's the thing yeah i get you it's not going to the people who are out there in the field or the clinicians who are like, I don't have enough time for it with each client. And I can't, I, you can't just give me this, these little teeny bits yeah. of time. And then these rules and regulations also here, man, when they get housing, there's rules. Yeah. No, there's rules that sometimes they're like, well, I, 
I'd like an apartment, but the rules are easier. There's no rules out in the streets other than yeah. just to stay alive. Yeah. Let's talk about... Yeah. You've been sober how long? Four plus years. I just, Damn. I just, yeah, yeah. How's, how, how you? F- um, I sometimes stop and go, oh my God, where'd the time go? Other days I'm like, tick, 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 tick. <laughs> um, it feels really but don't good. Don't you feel proud? I, 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 I'm proud. I feel like it's a rebirth. Yeah, yeah, dude, yeah, yeah. Dude, I'm 50, yes. I'm 58, and I have a rebirth in my 50s. And this is one reason why I'm such an advocate to have the conversation. It's, it's like you were never best. too old to do anything. No. I changed careers in my 40s. I went to school for the first time in my 40s Amazing. To, go get, to go get a degree that I had no idea what I was doing. I walked up to Pierce yeah. College and said, hey, I want to help people. They're like, what degree do you want? I go, I don't know. You tell me. And they're like, that's not how it works, ma'am. What degree would you like? I'm like, I want to help people. And they go, a psych degree? And I went, sure, that works. And that's how it started. Man. Tons of prerequisites because I did didn't know why two plus x equals five. I thought it was a typo. They asked me to write a paragraph. I wrote five pages. I was very opinionated. Wow. Opinionated. No periods. Run on sentences. Yeah, yeah. No rhyme, no reason to what I was saying. But they said she's smart, but boy, she has no idea what she's doing. Wow. Less than a fifth grader. I graduated in 82. 81. 81. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So you know. Well, oh, I don't know if I, gra- I think I graduated. Go ahead. Well, they pushed me through. Listen, I know when you said that in your opening, I was over here going, mm-hmm. <laughs> they pushed me through a variable credit system that wasn't working, so they needed to get us out fast and go back to the other regular high school curriculum because it wasn't working. So I was product of a failed system. Yeah. Wow. But, you know, to any of that, like I've been through, you know, mental, all the stuff that I've been through, wanting to kill myself or whatever it is, mm. when you get, it is a rebirth but you can take the, the wrong road, you can take the right road. Yeah. If you take the, the wrong road, it can get worse, I think, it, whatever it is. You can go back to drinking. Oh, it's worse now. Mm-hmm. But I've taken the right road, and it feels, I have so much joy now. Yeah. I can't even tell you. Like, there's a story I tell. During the pandemic, I was in real bad shape. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, real bad shape for four, month, four months. And I wish I, you were my friend. I would have called you. I know. I, I know. would have called you. I would have would've, talked you off the ledge. Yeah, it was, it was kind of like that. Yeah. But I went to see my goats and everything. Nothing was... Your ghost? My, no, my goats. Oh, I have a goat. Go- you have alpaca- like, like uh, bat. Yeah, yeah bat. Yeah. I love goats. It's, and I'm also into ghosts. I know, I'm sorry. Oh, you are? Oh. Oh, I'm into paranormal. You know I'm, I'm oh. filming in New Mexico. I'm in heaven. Oh, my. <laughs> I've seen stuff. But oh, we'll get into that. Oh, but, yeah, we will. <laughs> When you're in that state of mind, no pun intended, nothing, you, yeah. you see what, but now I go to the go and I, it's like, they're 3D. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. You feel this thing like peace and joy and cause you've, uh, you've gotten over something so hard. Exactly. That's why when I go on the set and I'm like, Hey, gay guys, how you doing? Did you find her four years sober? How are you? And they're like, what, what, what? Why, why would she blurt that out? I'm like, cause we have, to, we have to, I'm not going to say normalize. Uh, that's just the wrong word. We just have to take the sting out of it. Yeah. Take yeah. the sting out of it. Yeah. I am proud yeah. that it has been a fucking hard journey to stay sober and especially during the pandemic when you know look at all the people who went to the light way too so- soon i lost way, friends to my yeah. addiction or their addictions i've lost my son's eight 17 year old friend who i was a year sober and he, he was like a son to me fentanyl done gone a 20 year old i went to to rehab with trev i call it the trevor pause i use it all the time he was just a great guy 20 over overdose got out of rehab but, you know it just we all have these stories yeah. Unfortunately, stories are no longer so rare. Yeah, that's really sad. Um, but I will tell you this about feeling really good is that I have two boys that I'm raising on my own. Always have. And let me tell you one thing that I was told by my um act or uh, sober uh, coach. coach. I had a sober coach. She was like, first of all, stay in your lane, but also just show because you you. I wanted to jump in their lane and try to save them from themselves so they didn't take my journey or my father. Alcoholism's all over and mental oh. health. Oh, my mom had shock treatments in the fifties, dude. Damn. The mother who gave birth to me, not Shell and Rick, but me and my. Are sister. you bipolar? No. No, but I've been called ADHD. ADHD oh, year. what is that? ADHD. You know, people. It's like you need to slow down. I'm like, maybe you need to speed up. <laughs> 
I'm on 45, that's, you're on 33. You know what I'm talking about? These yeah, are the albums. Yeah. My kids are like, what am I? I get you, I get you. We used to have <laughs> albums. 33, the Fleetwood Mac was released on the 45, soft <laughs> sell. Um, so one of the things that M Kathleen Murphy, who was this, is this amazing therapist who ran Breathe Healing Life Healing Center, which is where I went for rehab, said something that I just, to this day, I repeat all the time because I want to share this, and I think you're going to yes. understand it. When you're in your disease or when you're in your pain of mental health or when you're in the darkness of it, whatever it is when you're there, and then when you discover the other side of that, the yeah. polar opposite of that, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You go from being the identified problem to the identified possibility. Right. You and I are the identified possibility. Right. E everyone who's found the flip side of being able to live with a mental health issue or in recovery for addiction or whatever. And these are huge things to conquer. Yeah. And I don't take them lightly and I celebrate them. And yet people on the set, let me go back to that, yeah. will come up to me and go, I love the way you're so loud. I have 35 years sober. I know. And I, I go, know. why are you whispering? I know. And they'll go, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. I said, that's why I'm loud. Yeah. Because what you, 35 years, and you're whispering, because we still have social stigma around it. We still have a sting. But the more we talk about it, you and I and anyone else, you know. And so I do that so that people can come out and say, hey, I'm, I'm one of her. That's right. It's, come yeah. over here. You're one of me. You're one of the... We That's are the right. identified possibility, except we're showing other people that you can lean into your shit. Yeah. It's going to hurt. It's not going to feel great all the time. But guess what? Boy, the rewards are amazing. They are great. My worst yeah. days sober are nothing compared to my worst days when I was in my disease. You right. Know? And you have a chance to really address all sorts of stuff. Whatever torture we go through, yeah. there's a gift. There's yeah. a gift. Just like when people pass away, I always say, they leave you a gift. You know, whether yeah. it's three hawks flying in the sky or being strong. Yeah. There's always a gift. I've had so many people die. It's not even funny. Yeah. yeah. See, I don't believe in death. I think they went to the light. Oh, well, I do. T well, I, I, I do the I heaven we, thing. It's short. I've also said my bird died and, I'm, and then my son goes, mom. I'm like, she went to the light. <laughs> that's, that's nice. Yeah, uh, it's also a little kinder way to, what's to embrace that. Yes. Because it is a journey. That our journey doesn't... Because I do you know what I think? Dude, if this is it... <laughs> uh, that's what I just said. If this is it, then I'm out. Th what that's the, It's got to mean but something Didi. bigger, more, better, right? It has to. Otherwise, my Lord. Yeah, because come. I used to have a fear of dying. Me too. And, and until I got sober. Right, <laughs> right. And then I realized... Which I was killing myself. I heaven's, so, yeah. <laughs> for me, heaven's going to be the, the, the party of, the, of mm -hmm. the century. All the people I love are there hanging out. And, mm -hmm. So I'm not afraid of it because yeah. this is what we... Where we're at, like you just... So, yeah, it's like, so when you're here, what are you going to do with the soul that's in this body? This body's giving your soul an opportunity to do something in this lifetime. You get these, you have these choices. So sometimes, even if you can't help yourself by helping other people, it does... It that's work. right. It, it, that stuff will ricochet right back at you. That's my hair. We're so alike, it's not yeah. even fun. Yeah, like I give because it just feels so good. The problem is when I was in my disease, I gave till I bled and I forgot about home base. Yeah. I was always that chick who never understood on a plane when they said, put the, the oxygen mask on yeah. yourself first for your kids. I'd sit there knocking back my vodka going, you're going crazy. I'm, that, that doesn't even make any sense as yeah. I'm drinking. Right. <laughs> my kids are getting those masks first. Had to go to rehab to figure out what they were talking about. Mm. I am no good to my children or anybody if it, I don't work on home base. It's not my default. It's something I have to constantly work on because giving just feels so good. And every day I have to learn to give Mama Bear over here a little. And how proud are your, your kids of you? They're boys, uh, 16 and 20. They don't like to show their hand because it's not cool. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I know they're proud because actually one has said it out loud, Aww. which just like you earlier, any kind of like niceness thrown my way, I always want to cry. Yeah, yeah. I always say to my sisters, how can I tell someone's nice to me I want to cry? They're like, I don't know. That's so weird. I'm, they're the same way. It must be a fight for a thing. <laughs> Well, I'm kind of, you know, well, it depends who's saying it, but, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right? When it's genuine. You know, yes. Yeah, when it's genuine. How was it growing up? Mm-hmm. You grew up in Orange County? Orange County. Yeah. Not the rich Orange County. Can we get that straight? Okay. I don't even know. That's like Beverly Hills throwing up all over Orange County. I, I don't even recognize those areas. They, they had one oil rig and one <laughs> dying palm tree. Oh, okay. <laughs> and a beach. That's, and the seals and then the cute surfers. Yeah. Um, 
which I should ditch school and go watch them. Um, that was what the Orange County I grew up in. I'm not quite sure what's going on down there now. How it's many like, brothers and sisters? I have an older brother, Rick, and then, of course, Shell, um, my older sister, and then my younger sister, Lori. There's wow. four. People don't know that. I didn't know. No. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's. And any mental health in your family? Well, yeah. My mom, um, which. You already said that, yeah. Yeah. My mom, you know, um, when I first went to college, not knowing what I was doing, they asked me to write a paper, which <laughs> they were, do you want me to do that run on one big, fat, long sentence that goes three pages? Right. They're like, no, honey, that's why you're here. We're going to teach you how to write. So they said, write something that means something to you. So I thought, you know, I'd never really learned about my mom and her shock treatments in the 50s. Damn. So I wrote a, it's a descriptive paper. With, it's called a three, three thing. I see, shocking, I got to end that class. Anyways, three p- points. So I did my mom pre, during, and post shock treatments. And I went and did some research because my brother was alive at, or an older. So I wrote um, a five page paper on that. And um, they said it should be published. Mm. And um, I keep forgetting to do that. It's 13 years later, I keep forgetting to do that. <laughs> now, when did she tell you she had. Sh- or- well, it's funny because that generation. They don't. Uh, yeah, yeah. In my paper, I discuss my mom had postpartum. That wasn't a thing back then. Okay. Okay, think yeah. about it. You were just right. kind of, ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Donna's a little crazy yeah. down the street. You know, a lot of things were handled like that, unfortunately, in that generation. Um, and my mom, my father was in his addiction. He was an alcoholic, high-functioning alcoholic. I'd say medium. Uh, okay, high-functioning in the sense that we had food on the table and he provided for us. Right. But to this day, I always, I've always felt my father, um, had he not been in his disease, and he had the help that I got, and was ready and willing for the help that I got. I think my dad would have been amazingly, I don't know what, but I think it would have been magnificent. Yeah. Just kind of just existing in his disease. But then there was my mom with mental health in the sense that she had shock treatments in the 50s when really it was probably postpartum. She said she couldn't stop crying. And I'm like, Mom, that's postpartum. She goes, well, honey, we didn't have that back then. They just kept zapping her until she stopped crying. And she was supposed to get 18 shock treatments. I think she ended up with six or something. 10 minutes a week of therapy. That's, a, that's crazy. And she looked at me dead in the eye and said, best thing that ever happened to me. And meanwhile, I was looking at a mom that wasn't like all the other moms. And then it, it broke my heart. I just, even as a little girl, I knew something was off about my mom. Whoa. And so I never knew who she really was. I saw pictures of her. Her light. She's a little firecracker. Now, that is, shock treatments, what is that thing when Friend- they... They drilled oh, in oh, lobotomy. The lobotomy now, was, that was another that, thing. That was Francis Farmer, which I think I've seen Francis Farmer like 20 times. And this was even before I even realized what my, what had gone through my mom. But when I saw that, I, I resonated with that movie. And then later on, I, I started asking my mom for my paper and all that. Um, and interesting enough, my father would not sign for the uh, – the, someone had to sign for them, and he refused. So my grandparents from North Dakota came out and signed – for her shock treatments, her treatment. So you have a lot of, like, that's a generational thing, by the way, right? Um, yeah. And then also, when I said, well, Mom, aren't you upset? And she's like, no, I don't or do. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm smoking, <laughs> smoking her cigarette, <laughs> drinking her coffee, going, best thing that ever happened to me. Because she couldn't stop crying, and everyone was looking at her. She said they thought she was a leper. Remember, that was a time where all the, the women in, around her started rejecting her because she had shock treatments. They thought she was a leper. Like, you know, that's how they treat people. And what, the shock yeah. treatments was the... the, the and oh they just basically, God. yeah. And then they put something in their teeth and there's, yeah, it's pretty well, violent. you know... Uh, it breaks my heart that they did that to my mom. Yeah, it kind of... they rem- didn't know anything. No, they didn't happened. know, but they didn't know when I was 21 either. There was 19, who, who knows... And I was 21. They put me in a mental institution, mental institution mm-hmm. and I was tied down from my waist, my wrist, and my ankles in a in a in a room with four walls. They don't tie you up like that anymore. But were you 5150? I went on my own because they, my mom, and dad, and my brother kind of tricked me to go, and I went. And. How is that going to help you? It's not. How is that? It traumatizes you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was just trying to, there's a story I tell, tell, tell you because, because I, I will, because I like you a lot. 
Thank you. Um, I was in there and there was a, a latch on the wall. And I was trying to get out of the, couldn't get out of that. You're not going to get out. But I was trying, trying, trying. Finally, I got to this latch. I got the latch and I, I it was about that long and I, I was putting it to my wrist. And I started to pray. And then after praying, I took the latch, broke it in half, and made it into a cross and put it right by my bed. And I, I knew then it was hard because it was so much pain and, and ugliness, but I knew then that there was a reason that this was happening to me. And sure enough, here we are, right? <laughs> That's really beautiful. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of things like that happen when you're going through that I stuff. I also wonder, like, each person's a different level of resiliency. Yeah. I was hoping your story didn't go to, I looked at my wrist and I had that and I wanted to. I, I don't know what I wanted at that moment, to be honest. But what you did was, like, sur survival. Yes, Versus, what, yes. can I cut my, you know, and what makes a person to do that versus the person who made the cross. Right. I'm glad you're here today. That I'm glad you made it because it makes me really sad when I hear about people going to the light too soon. But I do believe that they come back around, they get another shot. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I believe in anything. I'll believe in anything. I don't think it's an accident I'm here. This is amazing. I know. We're going to be friends <laughs> for a long time. You know that, right? What? We're going to be friends for a long oh, time. Oh, yeah, you know it's that. great. I love it. You see what's on my finger? The whole time you were telling that story, it's a cross. Oh, my gosh. I had this impulse to give it to you. No, wow. That's a beautiful, it's amazing. Mm, I have it on my back, too, my son's name. And it was actually that color. It was a latch of that color because it wasn't like a darker. And like, I just got this. Like, that's amazing. All right, listen, because you're, I'm getting wiped out here. <laughs> and I, but, I'm gonna give you another one. I call these little nuggets. I collect them. I collect them, and on my Instagram, I always try, try to share them with people. Yeah. Check this out. This is something I learned, which is part of my rebirth. Okay. Yeah. And and look at the visual of it. This right. is, I'm gonna give you this little nugget. When try to be mindful and throughout the day when you're walking through the day and you're looking and hearing things through the lens of resistance. That's what resistance looks like. Mm -hmm. Look at curiosity. Mm. Look at resistance. Curiosity. That's cool. I like that a lot. And I often have to remind myself, and I often give that to people, because sometimes tweaking these little things throughout the day can really change the uh, trajectory of yeah. your day. Yeah. Because I'm like, why did you not clean up the litter box? Ah. Hey, Brax, is there, you want to tell me why the litter box is still dirty, man? man? That cat's Very in true. No, we said, I'm just curious. Oh, I'll do my video game. Oh, I know. Well, okay, so I guess you're going to pick it up when the cat poops in my room then, because, right? I, let's have this conversation. Let's be curious. Resistance. Yes. I like that a lot. And when you're listening to somebody, that's probably the hard part now, because the world is so divided. I know. And, you know, I always say, I want to be part of the solution. And I encourage anyone to... Come, come with me. Let's find ways to be part of the solution. And often that's not loud. No. It's just a, just a way of thinking, yeah. tweaking the way we think. Yes. Some, you know, right? Yes. Listening to people who represent what that looks like. Yeah. And then if, because the majority of the people in the United States, I just have to believe are good. They mean well. Okay, they hold different politics. That's fine. But I do believe most of us swim in the middle somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I think the power is. I agree with you. I do. I, and I 100%. don't know how to... 100 percent put get us all together <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't and know how to do that but i'm i try every day in my little ways that's the best way trying in your little ways how do you eat an elephant <laughs> one bite at a time right yeah let's talk about because we've this is <laughs> this is I, have this, coffee we're gonna be here for a while <laughs> oh is this my water yeah thank you let's get into let, let, let me before we this has been amazing uh it's just incredible um i gotta get into was was there any competition at all with you and michelle no michelle pfeiffer anybody who doesn't know i wasn't gonna i wanted to make this about you mm -hmm. right that was my, one of my things it's kind of hard <laughs> to i know it's the elephant <laughs> let's not talk about her sister or david e kelly <laughs> 
that's like me saying, hey, I've been divorced three times. Okay, now move on. Yeah, and. <laughs> yeah, I just said I've been divorced three times. Okay, Michelle Pfeiffer, Michelle Pfeiffer, <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer. Because, <laughs> uh, uh, like, I have a brother. He's not an actor, but we had. Um, oh, let me tell you another story. Okay. <laughs> okay, my brother, I love my brother. Uh, he, But we're so different. Mm hmm. And he's not an actor. And I, everybody always asks, was he jealous of you? Mm -hmm. And I say, no. And they don't believe it. Like, yeah, come on. Yeah. I said, no, he's not like that. He don't care. But when I had my first break, the second breakdown, I think it was the second breakdown. I had a hard time when I started out as an actor because I, nobody truly believed in where I knew I was going, except my mom. And... So my brother, you know, you know, whatever. So <laughs> I, I, I went to his house once and I was. I know exactly. My brother. Anyways. <laughs> I went to, I went to his house and I, and I was in the mag state. And I sat down and I said to my brother. Humbug, call him humbug. I just want you to answer me honestly. Don't lie to me. Because if you lie to me, I'll know. Mm. <laughs> and he, I said, did you or do you believe in me as an actor? He said, no. Ouch. I said, good. Now we're cool. I just needed that. I do love his honesty. Oh, yeah. He, but, but he knew he kind of had to be. Because you were going to bust him out. Yeah, because I knew he, yeah, he, I knew he yeah. didn't believe in me. But he was honest, and I was cool. And since then, we're cool. We've been cool. I think when I first started, my, my sister Shell probably thought I was just messing around or just fucking around. Like, cause I'd had a thousand jobs before I started in acting. I just oh. couldn't. Act. Yeah, she's probably. Oh, she'll try. She'll, she'll get. She'll move on and go on to something else. I just didn't because I was not very good at it. I stuttered. I couldn't remember my lines. I was just really bad at it, and I was stubborn as in hell. In the beginning. Oh yeah, I studied for two years just trying to figure out how to not go up on my lines and not turn red and stutter. And, and how old were you? Eighteen. When did you get good? Because you got great. And like, thank you. I mean, I, well, I've been working since I was like 10. You know, remember, they didn't have child labor back there. I mean, I would go up the block and just start uh, counting spoons with this woman. Right. And you know, 20 spoons per pile and put them in a plastic bag and then send them back. And I would get like 10 cents a bag. I mean, I was constantly working. So by the time I was 18, Shell was in Scarface. And, uh, I'd, and I'd seen her like, you know, in, you know, Grease 2 and in, in, uh, Fantasy Island. <laughs> Oh, wow. Who's that man? Um, Did yeah, you so, visit her on the set of Scarface? No, I didn't visit her on there, but I did on Grease 2. And they, she threw us in the background at the car hop, my little sister and I. We were really little. And so we got to walk by. We're like, we're in the movie. We went back to her. We're in the movie. We're like, oh, whatever. <laughs> you know? Um, there's no social media back then, by the way. Oh. So if you didn't go to the movies, you didn't see it. Or if you weren't in front right, of the TV right. at that moment. So she was on a Max Factor commercial well, my dad always hogged the one TV in the in the house, and he was always watching news or you know something. So we didn't see it. If we didn't catch it, we didn't see it. Yeah, he always hogged the TV. Well, not always, but when he would. Um, and then my mom was watching, and I'm I'm not shitting you. General Hospital, all yep. General Hospital was the main thing. Wow. And she had a few other ones, and you did not even walk in there because she's smoking a cigarette, drinking a coffee, like you know, Rick or Dee Dee, go, you know, <laughs> wipe your sister's ass or something or whatever. Just like when she's watching. <laughs> Her daytime <laughs> selves do not mess with That's the one because she, she couldn't stop it, pause it, rewind it. Yeah. So if she missed it, you know, That's you amazing. might get backhanded. So he's kind of kept away from her. So I totally lost train of what I was saying. That, but Michelle, oh, you Michelle. So no, we didn't have that. I went on the set. That was at 18. I thought, oh, I'll try it. So it's the first thing she said was, okay, stop. You want to be an actor? This is what you're going to do. You're going to get into a really good acting workshop. Do not think of headshots. Do not think of an agent. Just get into a workshop and then go from there. Best thing she could have ever done. So I got into Peggy Fury at the yeah. front. Peggy yeah. Fury. Not cheap. I didn't I had to get a job. Is that Sean Penn's teacher? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, Sean. Yeah, yeah Sean and, and Michelle. Um and um, got a whole bunch of them. Well, John Eric had some. Yeah. Some of them. Oh, I know. Yeah, a whole bunch. He she was doing she was coaching all the, the best, her and Bill Trailer, her husband. So I had to get a job and I was only eighteen, so I 
Yeah. Anyways, I got a job um, illegally slinging drinks at the Hollywood Tropicana female oil and mud wrestlers. Really? Because they, I kept telling them I'll bring my license tomorrow. You know, the dog ate it. Yeah. You know, oh my God, it's in the washer. So I illegally was <laughs> slinging drinks in a very hardcore male place. And so I could afford the expensive um, acting classes, which I sucked at so bad. Even Peggy Fury told me straight up. She said, "Look, you're not, you're never going to be as um, beautiful as your sister." Okay. That was pain. yeah. Ouch. Um, that hurts. But so. Um, but what does that have to you do with acting? Be, but you can be something else. Oh. So you know, uh, I think she had said, "Are you gaining weight?" And I said. I don't know, am I? I go, oh, I don't know. I think so. And she goes, don't. You're not going to be as beautiful as your sister. You can't afford it. They were very hardcore back then. Very not PC. And then Bill Trailer, her husband, said to me, yeah, you're Damn. never going to be as beautiful as your sister, but you're sexy. Oh. Don't forget that. Okay. And so I was trying to get over the insult of saying, them saying you weren't very pretty, but you're <laughs> sexy. And I thought, well, fuck <laughs> that. that <laughs> I just went home. And what do you think I did? First, I'm to call them fat. Or don't get fat. Yeah. Because you're never going to work. Right. Because you're not as beautiful as your sister, so you're not going to work fat, so just don't. And the other one's saying, well, you're not beautiful, but you're but you're sexy. I just went home and I ate. The only thing I had in, in there was butter and salting crackers, which I don't even like. So Jeez. I'm like crying, putting butter on the salting crackers, going, what am I doing? I'm up here in L.A. This is a crazy-ass town. And I am being told basically <laughs> All I heard was, you're a piece of shit. Why are you doing this? You know, and um, then go to work and get goosed by these guys who, because the female oil must wrestlers would get them all oh, horny, yeah, horny yeah. and I'd go by and try to give them a drink and I'd get goosed. Um, so it was tough times, but I was stubborn. I was called Dieter Du, my, or that was my nickname, but they called me a hard head. And I think they, they were right. I just wasn't going to give up. Why? I don't know. I think it's because I could never figure it out. And, and it had nothing to do with... Uh, Wanted to do better than Michelle or more. Oh than no, we're not competitive. We wow. we are weird. We are a very strange family. My um, brother, my sister, my younger sister, and Michelle and I. We're not competitive with other people as well. Damn, that's beautiful. We're we talk about that. We're like we could probably use a little bit more competitiveness just to kind of stay in the game. Yeah, um, it's almost like I have to get angry. And pissed, ah, and pissed to be. I like that. But more so not about you, but more about me not right. coming up. You know, I already have impossible. I always set impossible goals for myself anyways that I'm always falling short of. I can't even bother competing with you or my sisters. Like, that's just, uh, there's no room for that. Because I yeah. already am so, like, trying to. So, yeah. like, I have, well, I'm trying to get get better, get rid of, mm. I, I'm pretty good. I have an ego, right? But mm. my ego Early on, I bet not good. <laughs> was he ferocious? <laughs> oh, it was, it was like, yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, like I told my agent once, he goes, You don't have an ego. I said, Listen, <laughs> I love being king, but I don't want anybody else to be king. <laughs> That's an ego, yeah. But you don't, you don't, you're like a lion on the safari, yeah. You're like, I don't mind other lions, but I better not be able to see them out there. And I will run your ass 5,000 miles, in a, or I'll bite you off, your ass on the way out. <laughs> exactly. I see you, you're in trouble. That's you right. You can exist in the universe, right. but not in my, my range of, yeah. No, That's I, me. I, I, but you didn't have, and then, but then you started working like crazy. You know what's funny, too, is like I haven't really seen a lot of my work. Um, it's, I don't act for my to see myself yeah i don't pictures myself around my house i just i don't do any of that like after this interview i will not watch it not wow. because i don't already adore you yeah. i just it's done there's nothing i can do That's to go back and fix kinda it kind of should be yeah yeah and i'm doing it for other people for you for your followers my yeah. followers yeah um, i get you uh i love this conversation yeah. i feel like i'm part of the solution by being here that yeah. excites me and when i leave i'm gonna have to let it go to mother earth and just let it and Damn. hope it does what it's supposed to do because I'm super self-critical. I will beat the shit out of myself if I allow myself. So I just got to stay out of my own way. Do you know how many times people have said, Didi, get out of your own way? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, but Big Sky, we got to talk about Big, Big Sky. Big Sky, new night. Yeah. Just because everybody, I told you already, but everybody that I've mentioned Big Sky to mm -hmm. is like, I love that show. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, wow. I mean, it's, well, David E. Kelly. Mm -hmm. I had a friend, uh, Danny Quinn, who was married to Lauren Holly. Oh, okay. Yeah, she Lauren did Holly. picket fences. Yeah. 
that's another story. It's in my book. If you ever read it, it's. Uh, it's Is this copy over here for me? Uh, I'll give you a copy. Yeah. You know, after ten years of college, I said I'm never going to read anything again. Right? I don't read either. But, Dude, but that killed my brain. <laughs> but it's an interesting story. Okay, I might. But read she was book. doing picket fences, mm -hmm. and it was the big thing. And he's a great writer. Yeah. I mean, so you got that? How'd you? What happened in just that situation? How'd you get the job? I know you kind of talked about I was it earlier. Buying, I was trying to figure out how I was going to graduate from UCLA. I'd done the community college route. Son of a... Yep. Four years to get my AA because I was dragging two kids along. Because again, remember, I was financially, spiritually, emotionally responsible across the board for both my boys. So I was trying to get... I only went back to college because I wanted to help people on a larger level right. than just volunteering, which is what I did all the time. And at that time, I just at that time, I felt like the industry had been changing again yeah. I mean, after f almost four decades yeah you see a lot of change i started at 82 do the math i've been around for a long time i kept seeing so much change but this change i wasn't really liking i didn't feel like women there was enough roles for us and also you know it just started feeling like why is the girl that i'm hiring to watch my boys getting more money than what i'm making on this independent film that probably won't see the day of light like literally right, the math. Right. but i get my health benefits but i'm rolling around in manure because the production can't afford real dirt and i was like okay so, uh, something's got to change here and i was watching a lot of things go on in the world and in our society and our community and what have you and i thought you know i think i really want to help people on a larger level so i told my sister shell i said i think i want to go to college <laughs> barely graduating high school she goes that would be so cool and i said but make the commitment really go as much as i can also trying to get my boys to taekwondo to school their play dates the whole thing and so it took me four years with i found out i had a learning disability i thought i was dumb because you know yeah remember our yeah. schools we had reading group one two and three yeah. math group one two and three yeah one were the ones that were smart and then the two were the average kids i was in seven dude <laughs> <laughs> well i would say i was in group three with bobby who ate paste right. now here's the problem with bobby who ate paste i'm now an advocate for bo the bobbies who yeah ate paste. exactly so actually it wasn't such a bit hurt my feelings made me feel like once again a big piece of shit you know like i can't be smart enough i was painfully shy i know you might find that really hard to believe I was painfully shy, overweight growing up, the whole thing. And so I never asked, could you retest me to be in group two? So I just stayed in group three, um, which is probably not really a coincidence. Now I'm an advocate for those who don't have a voice. Of course. Um, yeah, all that kind of makes yeah. sense. Um, but then I went to college and they discovered, you know, ma'am, you're actually quite bright. You just have these learning disabilities. Once diagnosed or um, assessed for, and then I got accommodations um, a note taker and extra time in testing. I started getting A's all over the place. Dang. So now I'm a huge advocate for testing your children. Yeah. Well, go back to school, but don't let them tell you you're stupid. Go get assessed for yeah. like having like a processing issue or whatever it is. Because then they have they have like things now to help you. Yeah. And uh, you just test a little differently or you learn a little differently. Yeah. So um, it's so cool though, isn't it? I may have been smart too in yeah. high school if I got that test, but I don't, I, I was just fighting and, and going out with you were too busy fighting to like be tested <laughs> you and my older son i was cheating that. my way through every you know because yeah but a lot of that is laziness too right um, for me it was i just was i didn't want to go i didn't want to go study yeah. or whatever and so i had the chick in front of me go hey you know i said just lift your elbow <laughs> up and she's like what lift your elbow up i get to look at oh dude yeah yeah and then one I day i was too scared and so frightened that i got caught <laughs> right but but it wasn't her fault it was my fault so one day i, I said lift your up that thing did not go up <laughs> And it was the end, man. Oh, it was yeah. like I got in trouble and I got caught cheating and they threw the thing on the ground. And Anyway. <laughs> All right, listen. Uh, I think we've... I didn't even look at my things here. Dude, you can always have me back when the show comes on because we have Reba McIntyre. We got yeah. Rex. We got uh, 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 Jensen. We got uh, Roseanne Arquette. Oh. We, we have our cast this year has just exploded. We always each year have amazing cast. Don't don't get me wrong. Every year, amazing. And this year, man, we're just explosive. Let's so, do it again. Yeah, because we got and yeah. And yeah. you get and, and uh, get me some people to come on. Oh yeah. But absolutely. let them see that. The, I'll yeah. tell you. Okay, let me just end this, and then I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you as I tell the audience. Okay, people. <laughs> I knew this was going to go this way because I have a certain instinct in my gut all the time that is right. 
when it comes to the audience, when it comes to talent. And this has been, I, I can't even put it in words, and I'm not going to. That's this is the first time I'm not going to put it in words. I'm just going to say that it's, it's just been amazing. And I'm going to leave it at that, and please subscribe because we want to get to the goal which is helping people and 100,000 subscribers at the same, you know, not at the same time, but we always helping people. But what, what Didi just did here, it's kind of what I would do if I did an interview, is you just speak your truth yeah. and your depth and you don't hold back. And what was beautiful about what she did, aside from the, all that, is even talking about her sister, Michelle Pfeiffer, there was no hesitation. It was just, and it wasn't, you know, she just did it like, like we're just having a conversation. This is what helps because there's people who are watching. And I don't even remember what Didi said now because it was so much, but it was so good. There's people that watch who, that, that I know they feel right now that they're not alone yeah. because of, what we just talked about. They go, hey, oh, well, everybody makes fun of me for that. But now, if Maurice and Didi are talking about it like it's just a conversation, I'm not weird. Yeah. I'm just, you know, it's, a, it's, it's what it is. Can I add? Yeah, go ahead. So keep going. Can I add to that, that I think the uh, feeling of isolation and aloneness yeah. will kneecap you? Yes. I was there for many, many years. Yeah. A lot of people love me, but I was alone inside myself. Slowly dying really is what happens when you're yeah. um, going through that by yourself. So for me, it's like such so important to let people know that you're not alone, that just ask for help. One of the hardest things for me was to ask for help because I felt like a loser. I felt like, you know, why can't I fix this? Why can't I fix myself? I'm, I'm German. Yeah. My dad taught All me, right. you know, get up. It doesn't hurt. You know, well, guess what? It does hurt. And I can't do it alone. And I think for me, if there's nothing else I get in this lifetime, in this body, is for my soul to, to touch one person today. Yep. And that was huge. And when I leave here, I will feel very, really vulnerable. Yeah. But let me tell you, it's okay. Yeah. You're not going to die if you feel vulnerable. That's but right. you could die if you stay in your isolation. That's and you, right. And you don't ask for help. That's right. Because, you know, and then I will let it go to Mother Earth and I'll go home and squeeze my dogs and maybe yeah. rescue another animal on the way home. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do it again. For yeah. sure we'll do it again. And I appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.